Welcome to the Broken Vessels Podcast. Jeremiah 18.4 states, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. This is the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Simpkins. This is a podcast where we have discussions on theological themes for the broken to bring encouragement and hope in Christ. And I'd like to welcome you all back to another edition of the Broken Vessels podcast, and we're so thankful that you're here to join us today. And you have probably noticed the title of this episode being Brokenness Healed Through Covenant Theology. And some of you may know what covenant theology is. Some of you may not even know what in the world it is I'm talking about. But there is a certain way of looking at the scriptures that helps us to understand who God is and what God wants for his people. And there's different ways that people have looked at the scriptures through time. And we want to make the case today that covenant theology is the proper way to look at the scriptures. And I have a wonderful returning guest today to help us talk about this because he just recently wrote a book on the subject of covenant theology. And I love this brother. You all know I've mentioned him a myriad of times on this podcast just because he has a great way of talking about theology in general. And so I'm so thankful to have Pat Abendroth. So Patrick Abendroth, he is the senior pastor of Omaha Bible Church in Omaha, Nebraska, where he enjoys a vibrant expository preaching ministry. He is a graduate of the University of Nebraska, the Master Seminary, where he received his Master of Divinity, and Ligonier Academy, where he received his doctorate in ministry. And Pat hosts one of my favorites, as you all know, the Pactum Podcast, and he is the author of a book called Covenant Theology. So, Pat, we want to welcome you back to the Broken Vessels Podcast. It's so wonderful to have you back. Hey, Joshua. Thanks for having me on. It is a delight, and I get to be on again. This is awesome. Yeah. yeah. I always like returning guests. Kind (laughs) introduction. Yeah, thanks for your kind introduction. This is going to be fun. So thankful to be able to talk about covenant theology with you. Yes. Now, I'm going to read from, this is uh, from the back of your book. Um, I agree with everything that's on the back of that. (laughs) (laughs) Agree with everything. Okay. (laughs) Okay, good. So I'm going to read the first two sections from the back of the book, because this kind of brings us into the conversation that we're going to have talking about healing our brokenness through covenant theology. But you say the Bible can be a daunting book. That's certainly true. In a sense, it is more like a library boasting of some 31,000 verses in the 66 volumes penned by many different human authors writing from distinct places at different times and even in different languages. The Bible is intimidating. Then there is the matter of theology. The Bible is filled with hundreds of strict commands and requirements as well as gracious promises. So is salvation by grace alone? Or is it according to our obedience to God's commands? Is assurance even possible if obedience is required? If only there was an interpretive key for rightly understanding the Bible. Thankfully, there is just such a key. The key is the biblical reality known as federal theology, also known as covenant theology. So, obviously, you're trying to explain to people, really in a concise way, what covenant theology is and why you hold to that and why you believe that it's the proper thing to do. So, I'm going to start off our conversation by asking you this. Can you explain to our listeners what covenant theology is and why it is legitimate as a way of understanding Scripture? Yes, I think sometimes people hear what you just read on the back of the book, Covenant Theology, and they hear something to the effect of, it's a way of reading Scripture, and they say, aha, you're imposing something on Scripture to interpret Scripture, so uh, yeah. it's it's not legitimate. But the reality is, yeah, I, I say it that way to be provocative, but it is a way of reading Scripture that we impose upon Scripture, but before that, Scripture has actually given it to us. So we are actually afforded, we're given by God a way of reading scripture. We call it covenant theology for shorthand. 
but it's divinely inspired because of Romans 5. In Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, I'm going to go big or go home. I'm going to go big and say <laughs> we have a divinely inspired way of interpreting scripture because the apostle Paul is writing under divine inspiration and he interprets scripture through the two heads, the two Adams. He says, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So we have the two Adams, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, and two representatives, two federal heads, two covenant heads. And the Apostle Paul not only interprets scripture, he interprets all of human history ultimately through those two representatives. That's called covenant theology. That's federal headship, federal theology. And so that right there gives us permission, if you will, to know that the drama of human history is played out through representation. Uh, right. And you write here in page two of your book, it's titled, Why Care About Theology? And you say theology is important. And a lot of people are like, I'm not all about that theology. I'm, I'm more about relationship or I'm, uh, you know, I'm more about the, letting the spirit lead me and all that. Well, right. you say here, theology is important because of the supreme subject matter in view, God and his ways. There is nothing of greater importance God, the one true and living God, has revealed himself. To therefore know and understand this God and his ways is an unrivaled priority. So really, in essence, theology and covenant theology is trying to understand who God is and what he wants for his people, right? Yeah, and maybe I would like to say who God is and how he has chosen to relate to us. Right, he relates right. to us covenantally, and that's wonderful. As long as you're in Christ and not in Adam, it's wonderful. But and maybe it helps people to know that theology is the study of God and his ways. Covenant theology is how God relates to us, and he relates to us covenantally through one of two Adams. In covenant theology, it's just a big label. We talk about the covenant of works. God requires absolute perfection for justification, and we've obviously failed in Adam. And so the covenant of grace would be us not relating negatively with God through the covenant of works because we're violators in Adam. But when we relate positively to God, it's only ever and always been by grace because it's not something we could earn because we're under condemnation in the first Adam. So we're just trying to have big labels, big categories, covenant of works, what God requires, broken in Adam, covenant of grace, God relating to us positively because of his grace through the Lord Jesus Christ and his perfect obedience. And then we talk about the covenant of redemption as well. It's God's intra-Trinitarian plan for redeeming elect sinners. So, Amen. And when you understand covenant theology, it really helps you to understand the law gospel paradigm, the law gospel distinction, as we've Absolutely. talked about before, which yeah. is so, so important in really yeah. understanding the gospel. They just go hand in hand, don't yeah. they? Yeah, they, we, they really we, do. We really need to understand that God requires strict perfection. And sometimes people get freaked out. They hear covenant of works. Salvation isn't by works. Well, actually, it is by works. It's yes. by the works of another, right? <laughs> right, right. But what we tend to get wrong when we get the gospel wrong is we don't have a robust enough category for law or for the covenant of works. Right. Because if we do, as you know, Joshua, then we see ourselves as spiritually slain. There's no way we can do it. There's no way we can measure up. And that's exactly where we want to be. We want to be broken to go to the title of your show, broken in the right sense, mm -hmm. so that we can then be restored by God's grace alone and Christ alone. But if we don't have the covenant of works in all of its glory and all of its might and ferociousness, if you will, like the law, as you mentioned, there's no way we're going to get the gospel right. There's no way we're going to understand our gracious relationship with God in Christ. So both are vital, as you know. Amen. So that gives us a quick explanation of covenant theology. And one of the things I love about covenant theology is understanding that God has always worked with his people in the same way. And it's this overarching story. The whole word of God is all the story of God for the people of God. And that for me was just monumental when I came to understand covenant theology. Yeah. The unfolding drama of redemption, right? Yes. It's, it's, yes. And what's so amazing about that is before time begins, before the foundation of the world, according to the covenant of redemption, Ephesians 1 talks about that. This has been the plan. It's been unfolding. It was going to be all about Christ before Genesis 1-1 was even a reality. Yes. It's, it's mind-blowing. What I want to ask you now is, what would be the antithesis 
of covenant theology. There are those Mm -hmm. that they're like, well, I don't hold anything. I just believe the Bible. Or you have the other people that are, well, I'm this or that as far as the way that I look at scripture. But what would be something that would be opposite of what we're talking about today? So any system of works righteousness is where we would want to start. So Roman Catholicism would be the oil to the water that is covenant theology, if you will. Yeah. Any kind of faith plus work system, any kind of system that denies justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, they're not going to like covenant theology because in classic covenant theology, we say it's bi-covenantal, meaning covenant of works, covenant of grace, and don't blur the two just like you don't blur law and gospel. Right. And so monocovenantalism, even if people don't use that label, but I like using it just to educate people. So we would have one covenant and everything is by faith and everything's by works. Right, right. <laughs> Which is a disaster. So yeah. any kind of system that's faith and works in Catholicism, that's the case. In the cults, it's the case with people like Richard Baxter, who wrote the Reformed Pastor, which I think is not Reformed at all. Mm-hmm. He's going to end up being kind of a monocovenantalist kind of guy. There's even some folks who say they believe in covenant theology, and we would want to say, what kind? Right. What brand? And we want to say classic covenant theology is bi-covenantal, meaning covenant of works, covenant of grace are distinct, not the same. So the foes, the arch rivals would be those kinds of folks. Sometimes people think, oh, dispensationalists. And I know we're going to talk about that. But first and foremost, actually, no. First and foremost, when we're talking about covenant theology, we're talking about soteriology or the doctrine of salvation and how salvation works. And so I think that's important to understand the difference. If you want to protect justification, sola fide, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, all of those important things, you'll find out pretty quickly that covenant theology is your friend, your friend that can truly give assurance as well, which maybe we can talk about later when we talk about healing and, you know, overcoming brokenness. Okay, so we have these antithetical systems, these constructs like salvation by works or monocovenantalism. How have you seen these types of systems actually bring brokenness to God's people in really, in essence, because they're misunderstanding scripture. Give Mm -hmm. us some examples of that. Well, the big one for me just ends up being a form of legalism. There's different kinds of legalism. There's heavy-handed legalism. There's legalism light, if you will. But if we don't understand that God requires absolute perfection, If we don't understand that and allow it to slay us, as I said earlier, we're not going to really understand the work of Christ being finished. He says it is finished. His work is done. If we don't understand through the lenses, if you will, of covenant theology that God, in Romans chapter 2, verse 13, God doesn't justify the hearers of the law. He justifies the doers of the law. Well, that verse has been used to just abuse people and get them do more, try harder. Covenant theology is going to say, no, that's in the strict obedience category. That's in the category of you must do these things. You must be perfect to go to heaven. It's in the covenant of works category, if you will. And we can say, oh, well, that's not good news to me, but praise the Lord that Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Praise the Lord that Jesus fulfilled all righteousness, all legal requirements for us. And so he's the one who fulfilled the covenant of works. You can see it devastates people when you rob them of their assurance. Protestants are supposed to have assurance. Rome of the Council of Trent damns assurance and damns the assuring gospel, and they damn people who promote assurance. In effect, they're damning covenant theology, I would have to say. But we as Protestants, we as non-Roman Catholics should be able to have assurance. And when people don't have the categories for covenant of works and covenant of grace, oftentimes they don't have a robust doctrine of assurance and they end up robbing people of that. They end up just devastating people's lives because they can't put their head on the pillow at the end of the night, knowing Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's in my lane. That's covenant theology. I wrote the book so people can have good categories and also have assurance. Right. And that's one thing that I've shared with folks. I've said it several times since the last time that you were on here, but I said, as Pat Abendroth says, categories, categories, categories. <laughs> Sounds like a board game or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's but it, categories. <laughs> that, but it's, I mean, it's so important to have those proper distinctions and categories and covenant theology. I mean, like you say, it's like peanut butter and jelly. They just go together. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to borrow that line from you. <laughs> just like Joshua says, <laughs> it's like peanut, like butter, peanut and butter and jelly. They go together. <laughs> That's right. (laughs) The other thing is it ends up helping you read scripture the right way. Yeah. So sort of like law and gospel, these things go together. Is this a strict requirement? Now, maybe I should say as a footnote to Joshua, ultimately the covenant of works was only given to Adam. Right. 
So it's not repeated over and over again, but having seen it be broken by Adam, it is restated, even though it's through a different lens, it's refracted, it is restated in principle again and again and again. And it's so good when we read those statements and we say, I know what that is. It's good and right and holy and just, but it's not good news. Right. Uh, so thankful that there is a covenant of grace that's found to be mine in Christ. Amen. And you can read the Bible that way. Old yeah. Testament, New Testament. It's wonderful. So I had a dad, Rod, Rod Rosenblatt and Ted Rosenblatt and Eric Sorensen on recently. And one of the things Ted said, and I think really goes with everything that you're saying is that the problem with most churches today, and especially those that, and I mean, this is in a covenant theology understanding as far as like our discussion. Right. But we, we, we know a lot more than those Lutherans do. <laughs> 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 however, I, however, I grew, I grew up Lutheran, so I, yeah. I somehow feel justified. Being able to say that. <laughs> however, what they're saying goes right along with what we're saying, because something that yeah. he said was the problem with most churches is, and I think too, another point is a lot of reason people deconstruct so-called mm -hmm. from church mm -hmm. and from the faith is because the gospel isn't a proper gospel. So they're not even deconstructing from the actual gospel, but in all of these churches and where all of this stuff is smushed together. And like you say, like mono covenantalism, where it's all law and all gospel. I mean, it's so confusing. Yes. The problem is, is that the law is not big enough or not strict enough. But what he said was they think they have an achievable law. That's the problem. We do not I have an achievable law. That's so good and insightful, and I'm so pleased you bring that up because that's absolutely right. Romans 10 is a favorite text of mine anymore these days because that was the very problem with the people who rejected Christ. They created their own law, and it was scalable like a wall, like you climb a wall. If the wall is 20 feet tall, if you will, God's perfect law, they created a wall that was four feet tall. And with a little hard effort and training, <laughs> they could make their way up and over it. And it's just not the case. So we want God's law to be to love God perfectly, personally, perpetually, heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. And when we really realize that, we realize that we've never done that. Nope. And, so, <laughs> and that's the reason we needed a substitute to stand in in our place to do it for us. Praise God so, for Christ. So wonderful, right? Our <laughs> champion savior who won, who did it all. It's absolutely wonderful to think about how he's done this for us. Amen. And when we think of legalists, oftentimes we think, oh, it's too much law. So to go to your point, no, maybe it's not enough law. Right. Somehow it's stuff we can do. No, with perfect motives, we can't do that. No. <laughs> then we have these other people who I call law light, where, you know, isn't it good and nice that all that God requires of us is that we love him? Right. Well, yeah. that's not good news. <laughs> he requires that we love him perfectly. So Joel Olstein is a legalist when yeah. he says you know, things like that. But people don't think of him as legalistic because he's got a smile and it sounds easy. But that's another form of spiritual abuse and hurting people and breaking people. Because now, again, it's if you just love God. And I think it was Martin Luther since we want to give the Lutherans some free press here. <laughs> uh, since I was hating on him for a second. <laughs> you know, Luther, he came kept going to his mentor, as I recall, and he just kept telling him, you know, Luther, just love God more. It'll be okay. Just love God more. And eventually, you know, Luther has his moment. I don't love God. In fact, the problem is I hate God. Yeah. And even though we don't want to promote that blasphemous statement, in a sense, it's good because now all of a sudden, aha, he's on the right track. He's being honest. He's being honest. And now he realizes that the problem is he doesn't love God sufficiently, nor can he and he's going to need to look outside of himself to look to someone else, Jesus, who did love perfectly, personally and perpetually. And so it's exciting stuff. Once you start to see it, you can't unsee it, right? Yeah, it really is. And understanding, you know, when we get away from this whole do more, try harder, somehow you can achieve the law. Once you realize none of that is the gospel, none of that is what God requires. Once we realize it's just being like the publican and getting down on our knees and beating our breast and saying, have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. Then we realize, hey, I'm going justified down to my house because I'm not trusting in me. I'm trusting in him. Absolutely. And you know, it's mind blowing to think that man could never have been more justified than he was that day. Amen. Amen. He could, he could grow in grace and he can grow in sanctification and all of those things. But the reality is judgment day was previewed for him. He was legally forensically declared righteous then and there. And when we realize that his righteousness was in heaven, 
because it's the Lord Jesus who's ascended, who is his righteousness, could not ever be more righteous, could not ever be more justified because we have Christ's righteousness given to us. Wow. That's just delightful. Awesome. Well, there's another aspect of misunderstanding covenant theology that I think is very prevalent today, especially right now in the political climate that we're in, Mm -hmm. where if you say that you believe in covenant theology, people say, oh, you believe in that quote unquote replacement theology. The reason they say that we believe in replacement theology, or they call it replacement theology, is because they say mm-hmm. that we're saying the church replaces Israel. And so we'll get into that. Yes. But covenant theology is considered controversial because of that. And I keep hearing that thrown at us. How would you respond to this characterization where obviously there's a lot of fear mongering going on nowadays? Mm-hmm. And it's been going on for a long time, specifically within the dispensational world, which we both came from. It has a lot of eschatological implications, basically. And yes. the thing is, is that when you misunderstand scripture, it can bring a lot of fear to yourself because you're like, oh, what's going on in the world? And then we can get so way off and so like not focused on Christ and the gospel that we're waiting for the temple to be rebuilt and all this stuff going on. So let's go ahead and talk about that a little bit. Okay. So at a 30,000 foot level, I totally agree with you as far as it's prevalent, but I wrote the book Covenant Theology with the express purpose of winning people over who don't really know what it is or need clarification. And I wrote it in a sense from a perspective of a dispensationalist trying to say, that doesn't sound right, but <laughs> but, but here's what I mean by it. I didn't throw rocks at dispensationalists right. because it's about soteriology. So when I looked up Covenant Theology in the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology years ago, it talked about the covenant of works, covenant of grace, covenant of redemption. And all of those things have to do with really salvation and how God relates to us and justification and those kinds of things. Right. And so I want to say to dispensationalists, covenant theology is not your enemy. You can believe in pre-trib rapture, future for geopolitical, national Israel. You can keep all of that. It's not advised. Right. (laughs) Okay. You you can keep all of that, but covenant theology is not talking about an end times millennial view, an end times kind of specific thing, other than the most important end times event, and that is Judgment Day. Right. And that eschatological event is already settled in light of Romans 8.1. Thank you, covenant theology, for helping us to understand that. So first and foremost, I want to say the opposite of covenant theology is not dispensationalism. Right. The opposite is Romanism, is monocovenantalism, and you find it with those who oppose the gospel of grace. Right. Now, having said all of that, as far as the things we see, going to your question, Joshua, replacement theology, I reject that because I don't believe in replacement theology. I don't think that the church replaces Israel. It's just, you know, throwing rocks, if you will. But I will say I do because I believe in progressive revelation in light of Hebrews chapter one, in light of the book of Hebrews. I do believe in fulfillment theology. Amen. I do believe that Jesus is the ultimate son and not Israel. And so we should unpack that a little bit, but a lot of times people think in Israel-centric ways that the Bible's all about Israel. Well, the author to the Hebrews didn't get that memo. Jesus is the apex. It's ultimately him. And what I mean by the sun thing is when you end up studying the sonship theme, if you will, early on in the book of Exodus, Israel is God's firstborn son. I think it's in chapter four off the top of my head. Yeah. Now we all know that Israel is not God's firstborn son. No. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But the text says that it is. And and I like to be provocative. I was just in Exodus saying, actually, Israel is, but they're not the ultimate firstborn son. Right. They're God's preeminent one, if you will, until the ultimate preeminent one comes. And I love it that they're called that because it's meant to cause us to say, this nation is special. This son is special is special. But then we keep reading and we see unfaithful, not loyal, not trusting in the Lord's promises and all of those things, not fulfilling the covenant obligations. It's setting the stage, right, Joshua? Yeah. It's setting the stage for Jesus, the ultimate son, to step onto the stage and for the fulfillment to come in and through him. Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, I think it is, that one would come after him like him who would be greater. Peter in the book of Acts clearly makes the connection that is Jesus. So we'd say Jesus is the ultimate son. Jesus is the ultimate Moses. All of the Old Testament historical stuff is meant to point toward Christ. And for us to go backward would be exactly what Hebrews is warning against. We're not going to go back to Judaism. We're not going to do regressive revelation. All of those types and shadows, priests, prophets, kings, temple, 
tabernacle. All of those things were types and shadows to point forward to the ultimate tabernacle, the ultimate, like John chapter one talks about, he tabernacled among us, the ultimate temple, John chapter two, the ultimate king, the ultimate Messiah. I mean, it's just wonderful, but people don't realize that Jesus is the ultimate one. Maybe one other textual example to try to help people would be the book of Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, you have Israel as the servant and you just start reading Isaiah, start in chapter one. I, I literally did that. I just started reading and you start seeing the servant theme. And who's the servant? The servant is Israel. But they're not very loyal. They're not very faithful. And then, oh, you know, cue the music, cue the gladiator soundtrack, if you will. <laughs> My favorite soundtrack. And then all of a sudden, you know, you get to around chapter 40, 42. Even the dispensationalists are saying, oh, the servant is Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right. The servant goes from being a nation to being personified. And then we all know what happens by the time you get to the 50s of Isaiah. And it's Isaiah 53. And he's the suffering servant, the victorious servant, the loyal, faithful servant. We know he's the perfect servant because he's raised from the dead because the wages of sin is death. But he'd never sinned. He only did what was right. He had to be raised. I mean, it becomes so wonderful. And then people who say, oh, you're just reading the Old Testament, light of the new. I want to go, No. Isaiah himself shows us how this happens. Mm -hmm. You don't even need to go to the New Testament, even though I highly recommend it. Right. It's in Isaiah, the servant theme. So I'm just kind of preaching a sermon now. So sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I was enraptured. Well, I was thinking <laughs> too. in the right way. Well, and the thing you mentioned about the types and shadows, when you look all throughout, again, the story, the whole overarching mm -hmm, story, mm -hmm. it's this progressive revelation and you see the types and shadows and it's all pointing to our savior, Jesus. It's all pointing to the gospel. It's all pointing to this great story that God has put together. That's just awesome. That reveals to us the creator yeah. of the universe and, yeah. and who he is and how he works and how merciful and wonderful he is. I want to interrupt you for a second, Joshua, and tell your listeners, the Broken Vessels podcast listeners, this is audio only, but I can actually see Joshua right now, and you should see his hand motions. I mean, he <laughs> he is going for it. He's he's dramatically <laughs> preaching. Uh, his heart is on fire talking to you about these things. So, well, it I is. Love it. I love it. I, yeah, I because it. you know when I when I really began to understand covenant theology. And I liked how you said it's fulfillment theology, but I also like looking at it as it's expansion theology because you go from old covenant to new covenant. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, in the old covenant, you have God and you have this people of God and the people outside the people of God. Well, mm -hmm. it just expands in the New Testament. You know, we talk about the new covenant passages in uh, Jeremiah and all of that. Mm -hmm. But then you get to the New Testament and you go through like Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, or 9, 10, 11, you know, where it mm -hmm. talks about all the grafting in and all of that and that mm -hmm. not all Israel is Israel. And we all are the Israel of God. We all are the people of God. That's not replacing Israel. It's like we got to be grafted in, man. It's awesome, you know, that we get to be a part of that. I mean, praise God for that. And when God made the covenant with Abraham, he said, your descendants are going to be like the sand of the seashore, like the stars in the sky. We're a part of that. And that's just awesome. Yep, and yep. when you understand covenant theology, it helps put all those things together for you. It really does. It really does. I'm fascinated by the text in Hosea 11, where it talks about God's son being called out of Egypt. And then you get to the New Testament and guess who the son is. And it says to fulfill scripture. Jesus is the fulfillment of it. He's the one. He's the ultimate one. And we're united to him by faith. And so we're not looking for a rebuilt Middle East Old Jerusalem made the new Jerusalem as we read Revelation 21, as we read in Galatians, as we read in Hebrews. We're looking for a Jerusalem that comes from above. Amen. It would be the new Jerusalem. It won't be the old one. And I love the old one. I love traveling to the Middle East. I love the archaeology. I love the history. I love the shawarma and the falafel. <laughs> I, lo I love the people. You know, I love swimming in the Mediterranean Sea, all that stuff. By the way, I'm pro-Israel because of other reasons. Right. But having said all of those things, uh, we're looking for the new Jerusalem that comes from above, second coming connected, related, and it will be far more glorious than anything that will ever be in the old covenant world, in the Old Testament, or even here as we know it on planet Earth. 
Amen. Amen. Well, we've kind of alluded to my next question, but we've talked about how not understanding covenant theology or not seeing scripture from a covenant theology perspective, Mm -hmm. all of the different myriads of ways that it can just bring brokenness to us in our understanding of who God is and the way that he relates to us as his people, soteriologically, not having assurance, living in fear. But how can understanding the Bible from a covenant perspective, from covenant theology, help us in a journey? of healing and helping us to come to a right understanding of the gospel? Well, for starters, it can help us read the Bible better. So, you know, we're all supposed to read the Bible and we're told we're supposed to read the Bible and I'm all for it, but we can read it better and we can read it more like Christians, which sounds kind of profound, but I don't try to read the Bible like I don't know how it all ends. I know how it ends. And the ending is written in God's decree before the beginning ever happens. So I'm reading it that way. I'm reading it maybe faster than I used to because I used to try to find maybe too much and too little, not hidden meanings, but I didn't realize that there's a story being told and it's unfolding and it's ultimately leading to Christ. So maybe that's one reason why it makes me want to read it faster. I don't know. (laughs) But so, because if you don't know how to read the Bible and you're a professing Christian, I think that's going to lead to a lot of burdens. It's going to lead to a lot of feelings of guilt. You have all of these people who carry their Bibles around and they're studying the Bible and having quiet times and they seem so spiritual. And then we sit down to read the Bible and we think, this is so confusing. Right. I don't really understand. I know I'm supposed to understand and share these beautiful insights on Facebook or whatever. Right. Well, when you understand covenant theology, you are given an interpretive key. Okay. Covenant of redemption, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the foundation of the world, purpose, decreed, plan to have everything center around Christ, to have the elect be saved, the Spirit would regenerate them and apply the work of Christ and all of those wonderful things. Well, I'm already thinking about that in Genesis 1, in Genesis 2, in Genesis 3, in Genesis 4. I'm already thinking, how is this unfolding? I know where it's going. When I'm in the book of Esther, how does the book of Esther play a part in unfolding the drama of redemption? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you say, oh, okay, I see how it's unfolding. It's making more sense. Jonah makes more sense. Nehemiah makes more sense. In the Exodus, it makes more sense. So you're starting to see history's going somewhere. And I don't think we should undervalue how important that is in bringing comfort, bringing hope, bringing healing to people, and not making them feel guilty because they've been not understanding the Bible the right way. Yeah. So that's my initial response. We can also talk about assurance and things like that. Yeah, I definitely think... Well, you've already alluded to it. We kind of started with it. The fact that we want assurance. We want to be healed from the lack of assurance. And, and i.e., a good book that you can pick up is called Gospel Assurance by Mike Abendroth, just FYI there. One of the bigger <laughs> sinners that I know. <laughs> Which I'm sure uh, Mike would tell you too. He's a covenant theologian. So, but yep. understanding covenant theology, and here's the thing, folks covenant theology has been around a long, long time. It's only recently that people have not really held to covenant theology, more or less, except mm-hmm. for the Roman Catholic mm-hmm. Church. So, there's so much out there to give us assurance. Why? Well, it's because we understand the Bible from a covenant perspective. That's how. Yeah. Because Through we, one man's obedience. Right. I just want to have that just stuck in my mind as a refrain through one man's obedience, through one man's obedience. That's where I gain a righteous status before God, a legal right standing before God is through one man's obedience. And the reality is if people want to control you and people want to manipulate you through guilt and through legalism and all sorts of things, that's the last thing they want you to know. Right. They do not want you to know that you have peace with God, right? right. Romans 5, one. all of these wonderful things. And now that we have assurance because of the work of the Lord, which covenant theology didn't invent, but it does try to explain in a way that's understandable, shorthand wise, then we're free to do the right thing. It, mm-hmm. it emboldens us. It empowers us. Now we want to obey. We want to do the right thing. And we're not cowering in utter fear that if I slip up, I'm smoked. Right. It's just not the case. I don't know if we talked about this before or not, Joshua, but one of my favorite illustrations about this boldness that comes from security comes from a certain mountain bike trail that I ride. And uh, you knew it was going to come back to cycling because that's just, (laughs) it's the cycling hermeneutic. Yeah. So there's a mountain bike trail not too far away from here. I realize it's kind of funny, mountain biking in Nebraska, contradiction in terms, but we have trails. How about that? Yeah. So, but there's this like a brick path that's elevated and it's maybe, oh, I don't know, a fist wide. So it's pretty narrow. 
Mm-hmm. And, oh, maybe it goes, I don't even know how many yards it goes, but I never fall off of it. I ride my bike on it on the trail and I just always succeed. And the reality is it's elevated. This is an elevated fist wide section and I never fail. Guess what? It's only about, oh, maybe two inches tall. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but the funny thing is, here's my point. It's two inches tall. So if I do fall off, it hurts my pride. <laughs> right. But there's really no consequences. I'm not going to be hurt. I'm going to fall off and I failed, but there's no consequence. And so I think that leads to my success. I never fall off. I don't think anybody does. Everybody who rides that trail is successful. But if we elevated it by a foot, mm-hmm. I would fall off probably every time. Right. And if we elevated it by 50 feet, probably no one could do it. Right. So my point is we have security in Christ and it is out of security in Christ. Covenant theology emphasizes this. It is out of the security that we're called to obey. So we are called to obey in Romans chapter six, clearly, but we already have all that wonderful chapters one through five water under the bridge. Yeah. We're already safe in Christ. We have peace with God. Now obey. Well, I'm pretty bold about it and I'm pretty thankful and motivated and I want to obey and I'm not terrified that if I slip up, God's going to damn me because I'm in Christ. Amen. And if I can cross reference to first John chapter two, it says, I'm paraphrasing, but it says, don't sin. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hear you loud and clear. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, It means that in English and it means it in Greek and every other language don't sin. But then he does say, but if you do, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ. Here's the punchline. Jesus Christ the The righteous, righteous, right? Jesus Christ, the law keeper, Jesus Christ, the one who fulfilled the covenant obligation is the one who says, Joshua, oh yeah, he is a sinner. He's mine. That's all it takes, right? That's all it takes. He's mine. He paid for Joshua's sins. He lived a perfect life of obedience for Joshua. Everything's finished. He's ascended, claiming you as his own. That's what we need. We need to tell people about Christ unless we want to manipulate them unless we want to control them, which we obviously don't as Christians. I really like that you put it in those terms of there's people out there that, whether intentionally or unintentionally, because of their theological understanding, they really do. They manipulate people or they guilt people or and things like that. And when you come to an understanding of covenant theology, it's like the magic pill. It like takes that power away for them to do that to you. You can even sit under somebody preaching and trying to guilt you and you're like, no, that's not what the Bible says. You get uh-huh. it. Rather than just swallowing their pill, you've already taken the magic pill of covenant theology and it has blown your mind and it has opened up your eyes and it's amazing. I praise God for it. My understanding of covenant theology came when I read Michael Horton's book, Introducing Covenant Theology. And I tell you what, man, that was a game changer for me. And it was when I understood that. Then I really started to be able to understand, and we talked about this last time, the active obedience of Christ, which... Man, dude, that really makes sense yes, when you understand absolutely. covenant theology. Yeah. Sometimes when people say, like pastors will say to me, I think what you're saying makes sense. I see that it's biblical, it's exegetical, it's historical. So how do I help my congregation with this? And I say, well, start by introducing them to justification. Yes. Justification, and it is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And then they're going to be super excited and see it and be motivated and help them understand the debates and the fights over it. Blood, sweat, and tears have been shed. Then help them to understand the active obedience of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to have that if you're going to have justification, sola fide, faith alone. Then introduce them to the active obedience of Christ and they'll see it, imputed righteousness, and then there's no going back. Yeah. Now you've gone down the rabbit hole. There's no coming out because you see that, oh, Christ's act of obedience is him fulfilling the law's obligation as the covenant head. That's covenant of works talk. Yep. And now we, here we are covenant theology. <laughs> there, there it is. And I do, I love that book by Michael Horton. You know, the joke was that somebody needed to write an introduction to the introduction. So yeah. <laughs> I know that uh, Michael Brown and Zach Keel wrote their book, sacred bond to kind of be that book. Yeah. And us immersers to use poor language. Um, those <laughs> y'all, of us who, y'all Baptists. <laughs> those, there you go. Those who believe in credo baptism, we needed our version. So I wrote yeah. covenant theology, but essentially we are saying the same things. Yes. I just was dialoguing with Mike Horton this last week and he was kind enough to congratulate me on the book. And it made me happy because I studied under him and I'm totally with you. 
that book really, really helped me to see things the right way. Yeah. Just to kind of close our conversation, I just praise God for guys like guys that have been pivotal for me theologically, Mm -hmm. Michael Horton definitely being at the top. My pastor, Brett Revlett, who's been on this podcast, who really helped me to understand Reformed theology. And then guys like John Moffat, Justin Perdue, Pat Abendroth, Mike Abendroth, Chad Bird, Eric Sorensen, all of these guys. And these are all guys that you all have heard on this podcast because they know what they're talking about when it comes to the scriptures. And man, we've talked about this before. There is a new Reformation going on and gospel clarity, and it is so sweet and so wonderful and so freeing, and covenant theology is at the heart of that. And I just Mm -hmm. praise God for clear writing like covenant theology and so many others. And so I just praise God and praise God for you, brother, and for the package as well. (laughs) Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Joshua. And it's always fun talking to you because you've seen it, right? And you've you've tasted that the Lord is good. Praise God. Uh, And it's it's (laughs) wonderful being, you know, fellow beggars telling other beggars where to find food. Amen. Uh, Amen. We found spiritual nourishment in Christ. So appreciate it. Well, with that being said, since you're a beggar telling other beggars where to find it, why don't you tell our listeners how they can find you online and so on and so forth? Sure. They can find the book Covenant Theology on Amazon. It's pretty easy to find, as a matter of fact, because so many people have been so gracious to review it. So easy to find. It's not buried somewhere as it used to be. So I'm thankful for that. You can find me on Twitter at Pat Abendroth. Uh, It's not Twitter anymore, is it? It's Uh, X. X. (laughs) I'm so, so dated. I said, I I just say Twitter or X, formerly known as Twitter, kind of like Prince. There you go. The the artist formerly known as Prince. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. So you can find me on X. I think it's the first time I've actually said that. (laughs) So at Pat Abendroth, also at The Pactum, we have an Instagram account for The Pactum also. The Pactum Theology. We have a website also where you can find all of the links and all of the things, www.thepactum.org. That's probably the best way to get in touch with me is through thepactum.org. And I would also check out Omaha Bible Church dot org. And yep. um, I, actually, it's interesting. I actually put you up on YouTube Sunday afternoon while I was kind of hanging out after church and caught some of your message from Sunday morning. So if y'all want to hear some good preaching, um, Pastor Pat is on YouTube as well on Omaha Bible Church because they stream their services. So indeed. Awesome. Appreciate it. All right. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this episode on Covenant Theology, really understanding that, yes, we live in a fallen, broken world world. And it's awful that it's that way because our federal head, Adam, failed in fulfilling the covenant of works. But praise God for what we know is the gospel because of our covenant head, Jesus Christ, that fulfilled that covenant of works in our place. And now all we have to do is look to him by faith, which is, again, is a gift of grace that God has given us, and just trust Him and rest in Him. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing better to help you in healing than understanding that, and at the heart of that is understanding covenant theology. I want to thank you again for joining us for the Broken Vessels podcast, and we'll see you next week. (laughs) 